Dylan Carpooch here at artsbydylan.com, and last week, a few days ago, I was up in Chico going to the Costco and uh, with my dad, and we were looking at this bookstore called The Bookstore, and a uh, great bookstore. It's been there, I don't know, probably since the 70s or the 80s or something like that. And we came across this little book, and I'm a big believer in the importance of a good reference book on your desk, and as a government major, this caught my eye, William Sapphire. Sapphire, Sapphire, um, political dictionary. And hardcover, like the price was about 10 bucks. And this is the 1974 edition. This book came out in 1968. So in 1968, um, this book came out, it was 1974. Brilliant, right? Um, and you just look it up, and it's got all of the, you know, stuff that we see in the news. Or any, you know, pretty much any journalist should have this in their desk. And if you're a legislative aide or in, work in a political office with a or boss has a D or an, a, or an R next to it, um, this should be in your desk. This should be in every political office. Because it's the political dictionary that everybody uses. So then I got on Amazon. And I got the 2008 edition. I did, this is the the latest edition. And uh, anytime you see something on the news that kind of you know that they that gets repeated a few times, it's good to just look it up. So, like, what's one that's uh, on the news lately? Big lie, right? Um, big lie that Trump did. Ah, uh, yeah. What do you say? Big lie, right here in the. Political Dictionary, page uh, 52. Big lie. Let's read it. See what uh, the dictionary says about the big lie. Uh, a falsehood of such magnitude and audacity that it is bound to have an effect on public opinion, even if it is not given credence by a majority, a propaganda technique identified with Adolf Hitler. Hitler wrote in Mein Kampf, uh, the size of the lie is a definite factor in causing it to be believed. For the vast masses of a nation are in the depths of their hearts more easily deceived than they are consciously and intentionally bad. The primitive simplicity of their minds renders them a more easy prey to a big lie than a small one, for they themselves often tell little ones, uh, little lies, but would be ashamed to tell big lies, big ones. Something therefore always remains and sticks from the most impudent lies, a f fact which all bodies and individuals concerned with the art of lying in this world know only too well, and hence they stop at nothing to achieve this end. So, uh, big lie is a Hitler thing. He knew people are dumb and they tell little ones, so you create some ridiculously big statement. Uh, oh, go on. And they'll keep telling small ones and they'll become believed. It goes on. In the U.S. during the 1950s, Senator Joseph R. McCarthy critics accused him of using the big lie technique to intimidate his opponents in and out of the Senate. An example of this editorial in St. Louis Post-Dispatch of 1951. Gloomy Washington prophets are forecasting a period of the big lie of the furtive, or furtive informer of the character assassin, of inquisition, eavesdropping, smear, and distress. They lump the whole under the term McCarthyism. Senate committee headed by Millard Tidings of Maryland, following a four-month investigation of McCarthy's charges that there were 81 card-carrying communists in the State Department, castigated him in terms rarely used by a Senate member. We are constrained to call the charges and the methods used to give them ostensible validity what they truly are, a fraud and a hoax. The totalitarian technique of the big lie on a sustained basis. McCarthy's efforts helped defeat Senator Tidings in the next election. Some experts in the mass communications field believe that the size of the requested opinion or behavior change is important in the degree of change affected. Herbert Adelson of Opinion Research Corpor uh, Corporation observed, the more extreme the opinion change that the communicator asks for, the more actual change 
he's likely to get. Communications that advocate uh, that advocate a greater amount of change from an audience view, in fact, produce a greater amount of change than communications that advocate a position that is not much different from the position that the audience already holds. Big lie. Right there, there's your definition. In the news, you can see Trump's uh, big lie about the election in which he lost. And that was known soon after uh, the election, about a week or so after. It was pretty obvious that he was not going to win, but he continued to go on saying that he won the election. Um, eventually caused a massive change and January 6th insurrection by a bunch of, um, how did Hitler put it? Uh, the primitive simplicity of their minds renders them a more easy prey to a big lie than a small one. I guess, I guess that's what I take from the news of the big lie in 2021. But yeah, you can see how this book could be useful in trying to make sense of the world. Uh, what's another one? Infrastructure. That's in the news, right? It's, it's, it's in here. Let's see, independent image, influence peddler, inflation, infrastructure. Political entities, skeleton, the roads, communication systems, schools, power plants, and other facilities on which modern community depends. The word coined in 1927 proves that nobody, not even the great world leader and master of language, can kill a really tenacious bit of jargon. Winston Churchill tried. Emmanuel Shinwell, Labor Minister of Defense, reviewed for the House of Commons in 1950 the results of a meeting of the Consultative Council of the Brussels Treaty Western Union, a predecessor of Carmen Market. That's eventually became the UN, or EU, excuse me. Shinmo explained that the installation of signal communications, preparation for the headquarters, and division of the airfields were activities now known collectively as working on the infrastructure. Churchill rose and gave the use of the word fair warning. Quote, as to this new word with which he has dignified our language, but which perhaps has imposed upon him internationally. I can only say that we must have full opportunity to consider it and to consult the dictionary. Two months later, in a debate on the Schumann plan to pool European coal and steel, the word appeared again, and Sir Winston was ready for it. In this debate, a quote, in this debate, we have had a usual jargon about the infrastructure and the supernatural authority, or supernational, excuse me, authority. The original authorship is obscure, but it may well be that these this words, uh, these words, infra and supra, have been introduced into our current political parlance by the band of intellectual highbrows who are naturally anxious to impress British Labour with the fact that they learned Latin at Winchester. That was a good day, good debate there, Winston. Uh, considering the prestigious source of the ridicule, infrastructure lay seemingly dormant but crouched in the weeds. In the American diplomatic community in Vietnam in the 1960s, the word reared its head cautiously. In discussing the need to winning the hearts and minds of the people, diplomats and generals briefed correspondents on the need for a viable indigenous government apparatus. That is, a local Vietnamese government that would be accepted by the citizenry, able to continue after U.S. forces left. This became known as the viable infrastructure. Defense Secretary Robert McNamara said that viable phrase dr drives him mad. I keep trying to comb it out, but it keeps coming back. But with Churchill gone, linguistic defense collapsed and infrastructure triumphed. Typical home front use was in this 1967 New Republic article by Andrew Kopkind. If Governor Ronald Reagan had appeased the people, he had also alienated the major economic interests. California's corporatism, perhaps more than any other state, relies heavily on the production of technicians and intellectuals to support its, quote, infrastructure. Huge technological parks grow up around every new campus, the better 
to feed off the state subsidized resources. This indicates that the word has also absorbed the pejorative bureaucratic sense of superstructure, which is excessive organization. John Kenneth Galbraith in the New York, uh, the New Industrial State, labeled the organized intelligence directing modern industrial production as the techno structure. But in his 1992 campaign, Bill Clinton em emphasized investment in our infrastructure, by which he meant stimulating public works spending. For another corn inch that is met in <clears throat> early resistance, but cannot be stopped, see Medicare. That's it. Uh, the news helps. Could be wacky, but having a good dictionary to help explain the news is exactly what uh, I believe I would like to have for the rest of my life, which is why I have those copies of Sapphire's Political Dictionary, which I'll keep around. Whenever I see something that is in the news and I feel like looking it up and learning something, I got my one book. That's it. Dylan. Adios. See you next time.